five high-level and outstanding speakers. We're going to mix up the order a little bit, but all of them will talk about perceived security threats in the OSCE area. As this morning, we'll have a, a short presentation by each, about five to seven minutes each, after which we'll open it up to questions and answers from the audience, but also from cyberspace through Twitter, and perhaps if there's time left over, we'll have uh, a last round of interaction among the panel members. You have the bios of the panel members in your folders, but just briefly to introduce them, on my right, and speaking first, Thomas Greminger, who's the, uh, the head of the Swiss delegation to the OSCE, who will be chairing the Permanent Council next, next year. We have Rosa Otumbayeva, the former president of Kyrgyzstan, who now is the head of her own foundation. My old boss, Giancarlo Aragona, who used to be the secretary general of the OSCE. Uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, who's the chairman of the Munich Security Conference. And Alexander Grushko, who's the permanent representative of the Russian Federation to NATO. Ambassador Greminger, if I could ask you to start us off on the issue of perceived security threats in the OSCE region. Thanks a lot, uh, Walter, and thank you very much for inviting me to take uh, part in this panel with uh, these uh, outstanding uh, speakers. Obviously, uh, this uh, theme uh, is of great interest to Switzerland, since, as you said, we will be chairing the OEC next year, and it's a priority for us uh, to reduce threat perceptions between OEC participating states. And I think the key word in the title of this panel is perceived. From a neutral vantage point, a threat may not be great, and yet uh, it may be perceived as such by another party. Therefore, the better we understand each other, the easier it will be to re reduce the perception of, of that threat. And understanding comes through dialogue, and uh, the OEC is a vital forum for that. And furthermore, the OEC has a wide variety of confidence-building measures that can reduce the perception of threat and build trust between parties. And this, for me, is particularly important these days uh, because we witness, instead of moving towards a single security com uh, community, uh, again, a widening gap between East and West. And I'm not, uh, to pick up a debate of this morning, I'm not uh, talking about the revival of the Cold War. I'm simply referring to a widening gap between East and West. There is this trend of Western states to address their security issues within a NATO and EU framework, while the East is turning more and more exclusively to CSTO, CIS, SCO, and the new project of a new Eurasian Union. Having said this, uh, I actually think that there is considerable convergence among states when it comes to perceived threats. Most of these threats are transnational and can only be tackled by multilateral cooperation. A good example is organized crime, particularly the trafficking of drugs, persons, and weapons. Other serious transnational threats include terrorism, cybersecurity, Beyond the protracted conflicts that the OEC is facing, there is little likelihood of armed conflict in the immediate future in the OEC area uh, as such. Indeed, in the global context, the OEC area is relatively safe, peaceful, and prosperous. However, history tells us that we should take nothing for granted in the medium to long term. That means that we want to continue to take CSPMs and conventional arms control seriously even though they do not figure prominently on politicians' agendas these days. In contrast, there is a considerable potential for internal strife in some regions of the OEC in a short to medium term, due to the high degree of state fragility. <clears throat> and we are well advised uh, to equip this organization with capacities to support participating states in dealing with internal now, as many of you are aware of, most of these threats were identified in the OEC strategy to address threats to security and stability in the 21st century, a strategy that was adopted uh, 
just 10 years ago at the Maastricht uh, Ministerial Council. Now, despite uh, this apparent convergence on most perceived threats, it may still be valuable to dialogue about them, maybe in the framework of an updating of the Maastricht strategy, and this with an aim to build trust and confidence among participants. And despite of the important steps that have been taken in the past decade to work through the OEC and other fora to reduce vulnerability to these threats, we should also be honest. Some of the threats that confront the OEC are not ones that the OEC is well equipped to deal with. We should therefore work very closely with other organizations and initiatives to draw on their expertise and instead concentrate now looking forward, forward, there are a, a couple more points that I would like to flag. The first one is that most serious threats to the OEC space come from outside of the OEC area. Just think of North Korea, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, or the instability of Africa. In some of these situations, the OEC has no role, but in others, we should work together to share our experiences and avoid a spillover of these crises into the OEC area. A second point, many threats are in the second dimension of the OEC threat. Think of fiscal instability, corruption, barriers to trade and freedom of movement, energy, food, water insecurity, as well as natural and man-made disasters. And I guess we must increase the OEC's more effectively deal with these challenges as well. And the third point that I would like to make, uh, we must avoid the perception that the OEC itself is a threat. In some instances, the OEC is seen as being instrumentalized or intrusive, or its presence is regarded as a stigma. And I think this is a particular obstacle Today to OEC's work in Central Asia. And this is the very antithesis of what the OEC should be. It should be the place for dialogue, cooperation, for transparency, and even accountability. Now, let me conclude uh, by saying if we are to build a common Euro Atlantic and Eurasian security community, we need a shared vision and a common understanding of why should work together. And I think that by talking about how we perceive each other and by identifying the threats that we face, we will eventually realize that these threats uh, are the main problem and that we have a, a common interest in working together to deal with them. And as a result, I think and, and I hope that we will better appreciate that our security is truly indivisible and that achieving it uh, requires cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think we'll... <laughs> we'll uh, continue to go in this direction around the circle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have prepared uh, my one-page paper, which uh, was uh, required, and uh, I want to uh, clarify that my country, uh, as uh, a permanent uh, member of the OEC, and, uh, uh, which uh, stood at the beginning of the OEC, uh, we are committed to all the goals and um, uh, agenda of the OEC. Uh, but uh, today, uh, I found that um, uh, I must speak about uh, different things, uh, talking about the perceived threat, uh, threats. Uh, talking about one's uh, uh, own poverty, especially admitting openly that one is poor, does not seem to be common in any civilization. One tends to avoid this subject and create an image of well-being. But at times, it is simply necessary to talk about the hard facts. 
as hard emotional facts maybe for the one who talks about them. By the standards of the World Bank, Kyrgyzstan belongs to the group of low-income countries. Sharing this fate with uh, countries from Africa, Asia, Pacific, with 900 US dollars general of uh, national income per capita. According to the World Bank 2011 data, we are at the higher end of this group, but this fact is no consolation. Kyrgyzstan is a low-income country, but nevertheless belongs to the OECA, a body uniting the richest countries of the world. Kyrgyzstan is not the only anomaly among the 57 participating countries of the OECA. We share this fate with our southwestern neighbor, Tajikistan, which trails us in GNI terms by 30 US dollars. To better visualize where we really stand economically, I give you some comparisons. Moldova, the European country with 1,980 US dollars, the lowest GNI per capita income is 2.2 times richer than Kyrgyzstan. The GNI per capita of Monaco, also participating OEC countries, 203.5 times higher than the Kyrgyz. The one of our host country, Austria, 53.5 times. There are also some positive data. Kyrgyzstan, among the Central Asian countries, has with 70 years the highest average life expectancy, a fact that is not only due to our healthy cl climate and the traditional healthy form of life. The reason for this is certainly also our still relatively well-organized health system. We have also very good figures for literacy, for the share of women in employment, and reasonable infrastructure. We owe this to a large extent to the remnants of the Soviet system of which we tried to preserve this positive heritage. But Kyrgyzstan uh, looks forward and oriented towards a future based on common values like the Helsinki Act, final acts. The Kyrgyz society had to fight for these values, for this openness, democracy. We paid a very high price. Twice authoritarian leaders were forced to leave the country in our recent history. Twice democracy was reestablished. Democracy in Kyrgyzstan now has one main enemy, poverty. We have to bring our country out of the rock bottom group of LICs, offer our population not only promises of a better future, but bring real change. Poverty is the real threat to security. We must get our people uh, out of poverty, give them jobs, or at least help the people to get jobs, even this is beyond the borders of our country. We have an unemployment rate among young people of 22%. In rural areas, it reaches even 34%. If we don't succeed, our youth will succumb to the influence of radical ideas. Radical Islam has been gaining strength in Kyrgyzstan in the past years. Afghanistan is near, not only geographically. Kyrgyzstan is being undermined by narco-traffic. Afghanistan is near. When the Afghanistan mission comes to the end next year, the presence of foreign forces in Kyrgyzstan will become redundant. But I have to admit we have ourselves failed also in creating an environment welcoming investments. Our geographic location, the long and bumpy transport routes, the small size of the population already are natural hurdles for investments. We have added to this ignorance and greed. Ignorance, as we don't have the know-how to find the right and just balance. Only 20 years, during the last 20 years, we are learning market economy. And uh, um, uh, nations just demand to benefit from our natural resources and the interest of the investors. Greed, both by the investors who know of our ignorance 
and try to benefit from it in order to maximize their profits. But greed also by a series of our own politicians who only think of their own pockets and not of the wealth and well-being of our nation. So we are where we are. Little jobs, people draw their own conclusions and leave to find employment elsewhere. It is a fact Kyrgyzstan would be much worse off without the remittances from our people working in Russia and other countries often are under uh, dire circumstances and condition. As sad as it is, this is at present the quickest way to somewhat uh, alleviate our economic and social problems. What we need? We need access to foreign labor markets. 980 millions of the overall 992 millions comprising the population of all the OEC partner countries live in condition above LAC standards. The OEC, as I already said in the beginning, community re reuniting the wealthiest countries of the world. Would it re really be that difficult to give unimpeded access to the labor force of Kyrgyzstan, a nation of 5.5 million still being a least uh, developed country, but uh, which shares the values of the vast majority. Would it really shake up each respective labor market if a handful of Kyrgyz come to do the jobs that nobody else wants to do anyway? Could our citizens not have official, organized, of course not open access to the labor market, enjoying them all rights of others employed and not being forced, as now often is the case, into lawlessness and underground existence. I know that what I have said just might be naive in the eyes and ears of the audience, and I am without illusions that it will ever reach the decision makers on labor market issues. But I still believe that common values should play a decisive role in a basically value-based organization like the OEC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be again in this solemn hall. It's quite different from the time when I was the Secretary General. It has been made more technological, but it's, it's still a great hall, and it's a great pleasure to see you here again, I have fond memories of our common work. Now, coming, uh, coming to the subject we are handling this afternoon, well, I must admit that when I saw, when I read the uh, title of the session, Perceived Security Threats in the OSC Area, I had a doubt uh, you know, what exactly the planners of the meeting meant by this uh, uh, formula, whether they meant the perception of threats among countries in the uh, OSC Area, or whether they wanted to address the uh, perception of threats originating from within the uh, OSC areas. I assume that they meant both dimensions, so I'll make uh, a few comments at both, at both levels. Uh, of the first, uh, the way we, uh, it's the threats are perceived among countries uh, within the OSC areas. Also, uh, having listened to the interesting uh, discussion this morning, I like to repeat what some of those uh, present here have heard me saying many times in, in recent years. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, the former uh, adversaries uh, uh, who lived the, through the Cold War fully realized that the Cold War 
is definitely uh, over. So when I hear uh, comments like there is still a lingering uh, Cold War spirit, I don't think that is uh, a fair representation of where we stand today. We have to take probably a more positive view of the present uh, geopolitical environment in the Euro-Atlantic area. But uh, having said this, there is also, I have also no doubt that uh, uh, the former adversaries have not yet uh, learned or understood what living in a post-Cold War environment means. Uh, this is the consequence of misunderstandings, of mistakes made when uh, in the early 90s when the Cold War ended, but uh, uh, there is no doubt that we have problems and this morning discussion I think confirms this, uh, this analysis. And if I go a bit deeper into the reasons why we are in the present situation, which obviously conditions the OSCE works and position, uh, but not only the OSCE, of course, it conditions many, 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 many things and many fora, many. Uh, I think the West, uh, what was the West uh, during the Cold War, made uh, a very serious mistake at the beginning. It, un it underestimated what the end of the Soviet Union the end uh, of the Warsaw Pact uh, with the power system which uh, was in person incarnated in the Warsaw Pact, what it meant for Russia. Uh, I remember when in 99 I arrived uh, in Moscow as Italian ambassador and Igor Ivanov was, was the uh, foreign minister uh, at the time. I was struck uh, that even the most uh, I, I simplify, so don't, don't read too much in the, in the sentences uh, I use, but even the most uh, pro-Western, uh, the most liberal Russians in politics, uh, in the Russian establishment in general, were cautioning me in, in, uh, on, on certain trends uh, of uh, uh, my country, but also in particular, other, other, other countries in, the, uh, in uh, what used to be the West. And certainly NATO's enlargement, uh, we have heard this morning, was a major issue. Maybe it wasn't uh, explained by us and perceived in the appropriate way by Russia. But there was this underestimation, there is no doubt. But also on the Russia, uh, on the Russia side, there were the mistakes. Uh, uh, certainly the way it continued to look uh, at the Western uh, uh, policies, and NATO was the, 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 the key point, but not only NATO, every move was perceived as a way to restrain uh, and uh, confine Russia in a minor role. So all this has left and uh, uh, is still weighing, uh, has left consequences and is still weighing uh, uh, heavily on, on the way we work together. So there is a paradox. We all realize that we are no more, no longer enemies. We realize that uh, threats nowadays uh, unite us because we share fundamental threats stemming mostly, uh, if not exclusively, the major threats from outside the OSC area, but uh, in spite of this common analysis, in spite uh, of what in my view I think is not too daring to say, that we basically share the perception of threat. Ambassador Gruchko now being representative to NATO will talk and discuss, we'll hear a lot about uh, threat assessment, the perception of threats is a major issue. But I think in spite of differences which might exist and still probably exist, but basically we share the, percep the perception of threat. But uh, at the same time, we uh, have difficulties in really 
making good and exploit in full the new geopolitical and geostrategic environment. And we can say this, we can see this every day, both uh, within and outside and without the OSC, the OSC area. And of course, this uh, problem, this difficulty, and which should really uh, con con conditions uh, among other institutions, also the uh, OSC, is, uh, has, uh, because the, the discussion on OSC role is in itself a, a symptom, an indication that we uh, uh, still have problems. Uh, and, but I, I trust that in time, uh, uh, things can be uh, clarified and that mutual trust uh, can be, can be uh, uh, built. And uh, I think we should all recognize, rather than continuing to recriminate on who, who made mistake, who was wrong, I think we should now realize that uh, there is a, 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 an unprecedented opportunity to uh, uh, build a security environment uh, in the Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, um, area, which is not uh, a zero-sum game, but it adds uh, to the common, uh, to the common uh, security. And of course, the OSC, um, this has a, an, important, uh, an important role. It is a uh, forum which clearly suffers uh, from tensions or misunderstandings, but at the same time can help uh, overcome uh, these, uh, these difficulties. And I think, uh, to be fair, it has played its role uh, over the years, and uh, with realism, uh, knowing what are the limitations, but also knowing what is the uh, very important uh, uh, potential. Going to the security, the perceived security threats uh, originating in the OSC uh, area, I was struck by Mrs. Tumbaeva's uh, comments. There is no doubt that social economic issues uh, play, play a fundamental role. And uh, also, I mean, we can't blind ourselves that also in the Euro-Atlantic area, which uh, it's probably one of the most advanced areas in the world, there are still uh, uh, corners where this uh, uh, the economic development has not reached the satisfactory level. So, and this, this is clearly a, a, a reason a, uh, for potential instabilities and crisis, and I'm sure that the next uh, panel will address uh, this, this important uh, uh, topic uh, in, in, in depth. But leaving aside this uh, particular aspect, I think that f focusing on the threats within the uh, OSC area, there has been a considerable progress. Uh, in the Balkans, certainly. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, underestimating uh, the difficulties which still exist. I am very concerned about Bosnia, but uh, there is no doubt that in spite of the problems, in, in spite of history, uh, it is an area which uh, has produced, as, as somebody more illustrious, much more illustrious than me said, has produced uh, a lot of history. Uh, so in spite of all this progress has been made, the European magnet has played a fundamental uh, role uh, but the OSC has contributed. Uh, I remember firsthand uh, the efforts uh, made uh, by the OSC in several um, areas of the Balkans. It, we have been uh, uh, less successful in other parts, in other, on other uh, uh, crises, on other uh, areas. And it, here, let me say add a few comments. The first, in, in part, there are difficulties which are in the issues. They, they are very difficult. Uh, this morning, some of these issues were mentioned, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Transnistria, uh, certainly uh, Georgia, and there are difficult problems. 
I'm afraid that these problems, uh, which are already significant, are sometimes aggravated by wider geopolitical aspects. So this, uh, this uh, is also a problem, and uh, these elements uh, should not make difficult issues even more difficult. But to close on a more positive note, I was puzzled, I must say, I don't see either here uh, this afternoon, but I was puzzled by this morning discussion between John Kornblum and uh, uh, Ms. Bakoyannis about uh, uh, the OSCE role in handling a crisis. There is no doubt that the OSCE acts upon mandates agreed by all countries, so including the countries parties to the tensions, to the crisis, to the conflicts, call them whatever you want to do. But once the mandate is approved, the OSC is entitled to act and to take the necessary actions. In my view, and here I close, the real problem is that these mandates are sometimes construed in a way uh, as to limit uh, the OSC potential. So. Uh, uh, this is the problem, but I don't think you can doubt that the USC can help, and it has helped in his not too long life. Thank you. Slightly different uh, uh, approach. Why are we here? Uh, I, I understand that we are here because the OSCE is probably for good reasons in search of its future role, right? Actually, I think it is only a matter of time until NATO is also going to have to go into s some exercise like this because NATO is also going to be in search of a new role. Is this good or is this bad? Uh, my view is that this is actually good because it shows how much the world has changed. We thought 50 years ago, whenever it was, that it was an essential pr uh, precondition for our very existence that NATO existed. It was considered very important for all of us when we created the CSE and then the OSCE. Um, and it is actually good that the world has changed so much that threats and that's what we've been discussing here, uh, within this group of nations have become much less um, central to our existence. Uh, our security situation has vastly improved. But obviously there is still a major sense of unease continuing. And, uh, and I will talk about that for just a, a minute or, or so. Let me, if, with your permission, uh, Chairman, let me quote from a paper, and I'll, I'll say in a minute what I'm uh, quoting from. At a time of unprecedented austerity, our publics are paying the price for a huge joint policy failure. Let us call it that, because that's what it is, which needlessly raises costs for defense and misdirects resources away from social affairs, fiscal, domestic priorities, and other security challenges and threats. Why, two decades after the Cold War ended, why must the United States, along with Russia, France, Germany, Italy, all of us, uh, spend hundreds of billions of dollars, rubles, euros, pounds, etc., in response to actually what are old-fashioned tensions The most significant obstacle in the way of achieving um, common security remains a lack of trust, I continue to quote, a lack of trust fueled by historical animosities and present uncertainties in the European and global security landscape. This corrosive lack of trust undermines political and military cooperation, etc., etc., etc. Today, this paper 
concludes, today the common interests of nations in the Euro-Atlantic area, that is essentially the OSCE area, are more aligned than at any point since the end of World War II. It would be a tragic mistake, however, to assume that the window for developing a new strategy for building mutual security will remain open forever. We must seize the opportunity and move on. Now, this is a quote from a paper called Building Mutual Security, which uh, was written by a, a group of people uh, chaired, among others, by uh, Minister Igor Ivanov, who sits right across from me, and uh, with strong American and Russian and European participation. Um, I think that this particular paper, which we brought out uh, in the spring of this year, uh, correctly described the lack of trust as, a, as really our central, our absolutely central challenge. Um, we came to very similar conclusions and observations and recommendations as an earlier paper in which Minister Ivanov and I also participated called the uh, EASY uh, Report, Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative. Reconciliation, demilitarization of our thinking about each other, and trust building are uh, what the doctor ordered. Uh, but the question now here is, of course, if these are the challenges, if these are the jobs to do, what exactly could OSCE do to bring this forward? Uh, I believe there are things that OSCE can only support and advocate. There are things that OSCE can actually um, do. One of the things that OSCE, that all of you, can continue to advocate is, for example, that we should get rid of the problem which ballistic missile defense has represented for our community uh, because it has created more mistrust suspicion uh, than uh, necessary. Um, I believe that um, one of the recommendations uh, which Igor and Sam Nunn and, and I and others have put into this building mutual security report uh, should be considered. It may not be the only good idea, but I think it would be an idea that should be reflected upon, namely to create a, a kind of a contact group uh, to reconsider the fundamental uh, uh, issues and ways forward for European security. And let me, let me conclude by a thought about what the EU, of which, of course, my country is a member, just like uh, Italy is, uh, of what EU countries and EU leaders might do to enhance the role, the trust-building role of OSCE. It's just a small thought of mine. At, in December of this year, the European Council has already announced that it will deal specifically with issues of security and defense European Union. Well, my question is, let's assume the European Council, the heads of state and government of the EU, will come up with some really interesting and forward-leaning uh, decisions and recommendations and, 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 um, uh, and points. What will happen on the day after that summit in Brussels? Is the EU capable of sending a senior person or delegation to Vienna to brief the member countries of the OSCE about what the EU is planning to do in security and defense of Europe and beyond? That might only be a small step, but I think it could be a step that others would 
hopefully be inclined to follow. And if I may offer one other idea, which goes in the same direction, but it goes even a little further. I had the uh, privilege and the, really the, the, the pleasure and the honor of participating uh, last year until the beginning of this year in the commission created by President Hollande of France to review French security and defense policy, the famous white book, Le Livre Blanc. The French had decided to include two foreigners in this commission, uh, my British friends, Ambassador Ricketts and, and myself. It was a very interesting experience to be as a foreigner right in the middle of a discussion among the senior most French leaders discussing their own future security policy. Now why are we member countries in the OEC not capable of copying that model? What would happen if when Russia that goes into its own next exercise of redefining its security and defense policy. What would be wrong with Russia inviting maybe an OSCE representative or an American or, or, or somebody from NATO from the EU to actually participate in this? Let's be a little more courageous in terms of opening up and demonstrating models of transparency that transcend those uh, obligations that exist under present treaties. I believe the whole big world is, uh, is, is open out there for these types of ideas which, which, which could actually, in my view, reinvigorate and give a new meaning and a new sense to trust building, including here, right here in OSCE. Thank you very much. Ambassador Grushko. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to address this very distinguished audience. But I do believe that we have just crossed the uh, threshold of human ability to consume, digest clever ideas. So 45 minutes have passed. So that's, I will try to be very schematic and at the same time to respond to some uh, ideas, suggestions uh, put forward by previous speakers. Again, since I'm now in a quite uh, new position, uh, this position does not allow to look at things from the point of view of comprehensive uh, security landscape and we are focusing ourselves on very limited uh, number of issues related to so-called hard security. I think it's very uh, fair to say that at this junction, at this period of time, uh, we have to deal jointly with two separate security agenda. One security agenda we inherited from the past. How to overcome uh, these mountains of weapons, stereotypes in military behavior, uh, stereotypes in thinking we inherited from the Cold War. A second security agenda is very difficult one. Uh, this is very different one. This is security agenda of the future. And uh, let me start by a simple thing to say that uh, security formula that was predominant uh, during the Cold War and predominant in this Euro-Atlantic zone uh, now is fading away. The number of security factors is increasing. Interaction between and among these factors became more and more sophisticated. The modern challenges and risks to our common security are numerous and do not recognize dividing lines of the past. This is the fact of life. Uh, terrorism, WMD proliferation, drug trafficking, piracy, cyber attacks on critical assets are the risks to which we all equally exposed. All attempts to build in this security environment safe heavens are doomed if not supported by genuine international cooperation. And in fact, what we are trying to achieve in NATO-Russia Council 
is to screen uh, the uh, security horizon and to try to understand what kind of challenges we have to face in the future and whether it's possible or not to unite our efforts or at least to act in a certain concerted manner uh, taking on board security concerns of all members of NATO Russia uh, Council. We are witnessing the process of diffusion of power. This is also part of the picture. And Europe as a world centerpiece of power is being challenged and being challenged not by bad intentions, but because we face uh, the shift in global economics and uh, the very fact that sources of modern security history lay far beyond the scope of uh, West Est uh, context. Uh, all these factors are very important for uh, changes in defense planning and orientation of military potentials. Uh, varieties of involving military power in different scenarios is broadening. Uh, and the border between uh, the use of force and non-use of force becoming more and more blurred. International law, and I do, do, do share the view of Chancellor Schussel uh, is on a slippery slope in many situations and this is also uh, one of the risks we face together because uh, for genuine cooperation we need sound foundation and this sound foundation could be uh, only international law and full and clear adherence to international law but we see in many areas, you refer to drones, uh, we refer to this discussion about whether what kind of norms should be applied to cyber attacks and uh, cyber counter uh, operations uh, in this uh, online space, offline, uh, these are these are very pertinent uh, questions and uh, without uh, clear-cut uh, questions it will be very difficult to find the ways how to uh, consolidate efforts and to cooperate on uh, equal footing. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, these elements are uh, very important when we talk about uh, European security, European means Euro-Atlantic and Euro-Asian uh, security. We should not forget that here we are talking about Vladivostok to Lisbon and uh, this concept should be uh, absolutely uh, important for the future of this organization. Uh, coming back to, to uh, to, to security factors. I think that the uh, uh, second factor I just referred to is uh, multiplication of risk and challenges. Uh, and now we see situations where there is loss of uh, full or any uh, state control over huge territories. This is a new reality. And uh, the problem is sometimes not uh, to have a clear-cut uh, military results of this of that in military intervention, but how to maintain uh, this result and how to convert it in a peaceful development. This is also the challenge we face in security area. And we know that if there is uh, a lack of arms control, immediately the territories, uh, territories become a source of gravitation for all kinds of terrorists and extremist groupings and uh, networks. Uh, third element, which is very important, and I think today many speakers were, were ref referring to, to that, uh, this is uh, the progress in uh, technological uh, area, technological uh, warfare. Uh, that uh, also uh, has uh, uh, important effect introduced additional uncertainties in this security formula and it's clear from our point of view that any attempt to obtain military, military superiority uh, will have its bouncing effect and uh, very often asymmetric and uh, missile defense was rightly mentioned uh, this is not only uh, the uh, project which has uh, potential of a game changer but at the same time if we fail to agree on final co configuration of the system, having in mind that we are prepared to work with a view to uh, address uh, uh, missile threats emanating from the out of uh, Euro-Atlantic zone, uh, it will be a failure that will manifest that even in the area of common interest, we are still divided by all stereotype, uh, all thinking. 
uh, fourth, uh, this is and uh, this is also I think a very very uh, important element. This is uh, uh, surprising viability of old stereotypes uh, we inherited uh, from the past, and uh, a growing lack as a result of that between on one hand uh, social, economic, cultural cooperation, uh, which in fact based on uh, mutual and uh, uh, dependence and interdependence and the current state of political military situation in Europe, which is still divided by different levels of security and where uh, different uh, uh, members of different clubs enjoy the, the, the different uh, level of security. Uh, we have to find ways how to overcome this. One very interesting example, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting to look at it from the point of view of the OSC traditions. Uh, quite recently I learned that on 18 of March the last uh, US heavy main battle tanks left the territory of Europe. No US tanks on European soil. I think in better time maybe it was a very good reason for OSCE to have a special meeting of the Forum for Security Cooperation. This is one security message. But at the same time, NATO is sending another security message. NATO is planning uh, a new military exercise called Steadfast Jazz. And this is uh, very in line with uh, Article 5. It's, in fact, this is Article 5 military exercise uh, with all the elements of the uh, Cold War thinking, uh, occupation, uh, restoration of territorial integrity, etc., etc. This is uh, another security message, and this is also a reality uh, we have to take into account because the final thing we want to achieve uh, in Euro-Atlantic zone is to uh, get all necessary guarantees that what we do in military field is not against our neighbors, and what we do in our military fields, this is the common security policies with no uh, hidden agendas, with clear-cut vision how to address uh, security challenges of this century. And this is very good, and I do agree fully with Igor Ivanov that the document that was adopted in Lisbon, the list of common challenges for 21st century, is a very good roadmap for NATO-Russia Council to move in this, in this direction. Uh, to make a long story short about the OECE, I was thinking about, well, the possibility of OSCE to be uh, engaged in this new security exercise. Uh, and of course, I think that we should be very realistic uh, that mm, there is no big chances, big chance that uh, the owners of this organization, capitals, will be ready to arm OSCE with instruments we need in new security environment. I would like to remind you in this audience that uh, many years ago, in first edition of the Russian proposals on adaptation of the CFE Treaty, there, was, there were a number of elements which were very important from our point of view. We proposed to establish a military staff, a military headquarters within the OEC, and we also proposed uh, to have a peacekeeping units uh, under OEC command. From our point of view, at that time, it was a very important step in bringing uh, OEC in line with security requir requirements, objective security requirements. The time is over. I will not dwell on that. Uh, European Union is building a uh, military dimension. NATO is looking for a new assignment, and we are also uh, hoping that a uh, new basis for new consolidation of NATO will not be uh, the threat from the East. Uh, and that, uh, in fact, NATO will be more eager to uh, participate in, uh, in uh, cooperation models on collective uh, basis uh, with full adherence to international law. But I think that speaking on OSCE, we should not forget about OSCE as the platform for cooperative security. And I think that in future, OSCE could play a very important role of bringing together using its platform for bringing together all organizations acting in this Euro-Atlantic, Euro-Asian area. 
NATO, uh, CSTO, European Union, etc. And uh, we see uh, we see that uh, dividing lines uh, among the organizations are of different nature. Now I'm Brussels, and I'm simply following this debate between NATO and European Union. And as a human being, well, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to understand what uh, what are the real problems if, uh, in fact, 90% uh, of the membership is the same. And it's sometimes it's about the, 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 the cap on your heads. Well, uh, but at the same time, absolutely agnostic uh, approach of NATO vis-a-vis CSTO is also, uh, we cannot understand. We need uh, uh, cooperation, and this cooperation is in the interest of all. It should not be, again, a ideologically driven approach which does not allow this country to speak to other countries. It will be too late, simply. Uh, so, again, I think that uh, for that, uh, OEC has a lot of instruments. OEC has a platform for cooperative security. I think it was EU initiative, a very good one. Uh, by the way, I do uh, believe that uh, the EU and composition of EU within OEC is also a problem that should deserve attention. In fact, well, we remember that uh, OEC is a club of national states, and if it's so, I think that either we should think about how to uh, take necessary actions and procedural changes to allow OEC be in line with modern trends and to take on board this uh, integration process, or to, to stick to, 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 to the procedures that were uh, enshrined in all uh, Kelsinki Bibles. And, uh, we believe that they are very important, because security dialogue is the pillar of any, any attempt to build a new security architecture. And if we are not open, if we are not frank, that if we are hiding behind the backs of our colleagues or uh, uh, common wisdom of some organizations, uh, I don't believe that it will be a very good contribution to our uh, common security. And final point, I'm sorry for being too lengthy. Uh, I think that uh, the old agenda is also very important for the OSCE. I mean, arms control, confidence building, these are elements that should be taken into account very seriously. With all due respect to new patterns of cooperation, we have a lot of things to do. Budget austerity uh, maybe is a good incentive to reinvigorate arms control. Of course, it should be not only about East and West, it should be more multifaceted, taking on board all different factors, also uh, to take into account uh, the process we face in, 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 uh, in Europe. And for us, uh, we uh, uh, are very serious in our uh, assessments, and when we are talking about NATO enlargement, it's not about enlargement, but these are also about military consequences, about the movement of military infrastructure towards the Russian borders, uh, creation of new military bases, uh, air policing in a number of areas where there was no any uh, air policing, and there was no need for introduction of uh, foreign assets. Uh, missile defense, uh, which has this uh, capacity of being a game changer, but at the same time a huge risk of uh, destabilization and overhaul of strategic stability. And uh, this is also part, part of the picture. And again, uh, arms control uh, should be uh, a part of the uh, OEC activity, because I see uh, OEC without Paul Mill dimension will be very weak organization, and I don't believe that it will be mm, very competitive in this very competitive uh, market of security organization of today. Thank you. Food for thought there, a lot of ideas, and I won't list them for the uh, sake of time. But one that struck me is that the very act of identifying threats together could be a, a type of confidence building measure that since many of the threats are in fact common to all participating states, by working together to look at them and then address them, this could overcome some of the distrust from the, from the past. But there was a tweet exactly on this issue, somebody asking, how come that the OSC participants have overlapping security threat perceptions but diverging security policy objectives in Europe? That might be something that if we have time we can return to. Some of the panelists already referred to it. But we have about 10 to 15 minutes. We have a very full room. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. There are 
roving microphones as well as uh, standing microphones. And if you could please uh, just state your name uh, and keep your question quite short in the interest of time. Hello, um, my name is Selim Sazak. I'm a graduate student at Columbia University. I'll have two quick questions. One was something I was raising on Twitter, basically. Uh, since the OSCE is spanning wider in terms of its geography, uh, this is particularly to, to, to Ambassador Grushka, if uh, the OSCE could be a better platform for solving some of the issues that NATO Russia Council, for example, could not solve. Could there be this kind of a direction for the OSCE to take in, a in the future? Also, in terms of uh, specific thematic areas, uh, what about you know, cybersecurity, these emerging threats? Uh, what would be your vision uh, in terms of the direction the OSC could take in addressing these questions and forging a consensus within its members? Thank you. More. There's um, one here, one there. Uh, thank you, Fyodor Lukyanov. Uh, Chairman of Council on Foreign and Defense Policy in Russia. Uh, I would like to ask uh, all panelists, uh, I think what uh, Mrs. Otunbaeva said about the problem with labor force, the social problems uh, in Kyrgyzstan and many other countries, uh, member countries of OSC, this is an agenda which is really important, much more important than all the rest we discuss. But at the same time, we see that in all countries, uh, developed countries, Russia is not an exception, uh, there is exactly the opposite uh, mood to, uh, to uh, limit access to labor market and to try to uh, tackle uh, xenophobic uh, feelings which are arising. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be uh, a right topic for OSC to discuss rather than to come back to old uh, Cold War issues? Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank the panelists for inspiring contributions to our debate. Uh, with your permission, I would, make, uh, a I would like to make a comment, <coughs> starting off with the discussion. I think it was Thomas Gremminger who, was talk who talked about uh, the widening gap between East and West. And if that is the case, and I think that is the case, uh, there is a good argument uh, for the OSCE to uh, get more attention uh, and be used perhaps to narrow the gap. However, this obviously is not the case. So one remark would be that obviously we are also oblivious of our achievements. And this is also true in particular, I would think, uh, about the area of arms control, which was addressed in particular by uh, Ambassador Grushko. Uh, having said that, I think there's also a reason for that, namely that there is no imminent threat uh, which might prompt us to revisit arms control. But still, I think uh, it's an important area, and come back to that. My second point, and that is also quite indicative of the role of the OSCE. Uh, the report quoted by uh, Ambassador Ishinger, namely building mutual trust, is quite relevant to our work, and I found it very interesting. However, what struck me when reading it was the fact that, of course, reference is made to OSCE, but there's no central role carved out for the OSCE. On the contrary, there is the suggestion to create a contact group. And I wondered why shouldn't the OSCE be entrusted with working on the very subjects that are being proposed uh, in that study? Of course, understanding that some of the, the, the points made in it, like uh, nuclear arms control, missile defense, are issues which are possibly better discussed elsewhere. But, and that brings me back to arms control, my third point, uh, I think arms control has been a, a hallmark of the OSCE, and within the framework of the OSCE, we ha have quite, a, quite a, uh, an acquis which I think needs to be defended and possibly modernized. And uh, when we think about re-energizing the OSCE, I think it's quite important first to get a political impetus to be able to do so, but also to gradually develop certain areas uh, where the OSCE can make a contribution, where it possibly can also build on, on, on past achievements. And arms control is exactly an area 
where I think we can make some headway. Arms control is no longer catching the headlines. Still, there is an, uh, a role for arms control to play in a more uh, long-term perspective as some sort of an insurance policy against uh, any risks which might occur in the military sphere within the OSCE area. Uh, and I wonder why it is not possible to revitalize arms control and modernize arms control. Um, and I'm, un I'm afraid, and this is possibly a remark also after the plea made by Ambassador Grushko, that we see a lot of um, lethargy and uh, wait and see, also on the part of uh, Russia in this regard. And I believe that is an area where I could imagine we could make progress. And there's one point I would like to mention as my fourth point. We talk about the OSCE, which is in crisis, and I hope we will be able to overcome the crisis. But we should also not have only an inward-looking uh, perspective. The OSCE, in my view, uh, is a model for a regional organization for what can be done uh, within a regional context to foster security. And I think in this regard, it could also serve as a model for other regions of the world. And that is an aspect which I think is uh, not sufficiently uh, paid attention to. And I hope that this will change. Having said that, I would hasten to add, whilst we have a, um, a broad and comprehensive definition of security in the OSCE, we should also make sure that we build on our strength and not do everything and do so perhaps only half-heartedly. And that's why I believe uh, arms control is one area where we have an acquis that is very solid that we can build on. And we also have an acquis in other areas, like, for example, um, the human dimension. And there are issues which are clearly of importance in the OSCE, like energy security, where we could and should make at least some headway in defining what the OSCE can do in this regard, an issue which is of concern not to one OSCE participating state, but to all. Thank you. Questions or comments? Okay, then uh, we'll go back to the panel in, in reverse order, just to uh, recap some of those questions. What about the OSCE's role on cybersecurity? You don't have to answer them all, but if you hear any that you would like to address in particular, please uh, have a crack at that. Um, what, what can the OSCE do that the NATO-Russia Council can't do? What is the, the added value? Um, how do we focus more attention on socioeconomic issues, poverty, inequality, uh, freer movement and trade? Can the OSCE bridge the divide between the European Union and the Eurasia Union? Um, it's early days, but that's uh, a point that came up. Why a contact group and not the OSCE? That's more for Dr. Ischinger and um, how to revitalize arms control. That one will take a little while to answer, but uh, let's start and, and move back. So just one or two minutes each. Uh, thank you very shortly. What is this dividing lines? I think that uh, NRC is uh, becoming a body which is uh, looking outwards. And if you look at this Lisbon document, it has identified six areas of common interest for NATO and Russia. Uh, terrorism, piracy, WMD proliferation, Afghanistan, missile defense, maybe I have forgotten something. And in all these areas, we are not only talking, but doing security business. On Afghanistan, there are very important two projects that allow us to be very effectively combating drug trafficking, at least we hope. We managed to, to uh, train around 2,000 uh, officers from uh, drug, uh, anti-drug agencies of, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia. We have so-called helicopter package that allows a maintenance of uh, Soviet and Russian-made uh, Mi-17 helicopters, which are in service with the Afghanistan army. And this is very important, very technical, but very important contribution. I'm not talking about the transit and possibilities provided by the Russian Federation. And we have uh, a variety of different options, but implementation of this, these plans will depend 
on basic political issues. First of all, whether we will have a common security strategy vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan after 2014, and whether uh, we will have uh, a clear-cut and sound uh, legal basis, first of, all, uh, first of all, in terms of United Nations Security Council resolution, and this is the position of my country. Uh, so, well, I think that uh, OSCE uh, is more introvert, and it was uh, uh, designed to look at the internal situation inside this Euro-Atlantic zone. I think, and this is my personal belief, that before rushing into certain outreach, uh, we have to think twice. It's not the criticism, but because it will be uh, a change of nature of this organization. And we have to find a right balance between uh, the business that should be done in line with our initial assignment and the need to integrate OSCE in a global security environment. So this is very delicate from my point of view. On arms control, very shortly, I think that Vienna should remain a main focus for all uh, negotiations on arms control in all European zone. But thinking about the possible role of NATO Russia Council, I can say that it is very important that uh, before launching a certain process to have at least a consensus or clear-cut visions of the results uh, of any exercise between uh, guys that played quite important role in the past. Without that, it will be very risky, you know, to start discussions. And final point, uh, I've got this as a certain uh, maybe mm, uh, uh, constatation of the fact that uh, Russia is becoming less active in uh, the question, issues of arms control. It is, it is not true. Uh, first of all, Russia was uh, always a very important player. And uh, Open Skies Treaties, uh, adapt a CFE Treaty, ad Adapted CFE Treaty were the results of the Russian uh, initiatives. We strongly believe that arms control provides uh, very good instruments of uh, security in the new security environment. And in fact, arms control is about of having more security with less means. But at the same time, ball is clearly on, on, on the side of our partners. We, we did what we can. And if there is a real interest in having uh, this uh, vehicle in motion, uh, we, 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 we will be prepared to help to do it. But uh, one cannot expect that in each and every situation, uh, the Russian Federation will continue to be, well, uh, to play a leading role. Uh, this is something which uh, requires to, uh, to for tango. Well, let me, uh, let me make two very brief points. Uh, first, on arms control, without repeating what's just been said, I certainly share the view that uh, this has been and should continue to be a major issue of, um, uh, of concern and of activity of the OSE community. I, I think that it would be a big mistake to believe just simply because there is no major military threat uh, that is visible to our publics in the way that this used to be the case. We, should, we can forget about it. No. Um, Opportunities should be seized, and arms control, by the way, including nuclear, should remain on the agenda. Point two, on the question which was addressed to me about this idea of the contact group, uh, the idea is not, I should, uh, I should, I, w I want to insist, to draw anything away from OEC. The, the, the idea uh, was, uh, is there a way, or uh, could there be ideas how the, in, the entire process of thinking about Euro-Atlantic and Euro-Asian security, how could that process be, be re-energized? Could you bring together maybe people from the NATO community, from the EU community, from OSCE, and conceivably from other institutions? Let's not forget there's also the United Nations. Uh, could one conceive of something like this that could re-energize the process. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it would be normal if then at the end of such a uh, process, 
uh, concrete recommendations would result in, uh, in suggestions to strengthen um, the OSCE. So I just want to make sure that those who uh, are interested in this building mutual security report, uh, this is not, the report is not saying we should invent something new or replace OSCE. On the contrary, the, the, the surge is how can we use what we have, and OSCE is certainly one of the instruments and organizations which we have, and we should cer certainly not abandon that, but strengthen it. Well, uh, really very few and brief comments on the OEC role. I'm obviously in uh, favor of energizing, uh, if need be, the OEC. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that we can, uh, we can say realistically the OEC can uh, replace the NATO the Russia. There are different uh, fora, and not only because, as Ambassador Grushka has said, the NATO Russia Council uh, somehow looks outwardly, uh, uh, but because NATO Russia Council is a unique uh, forum where at least the certain aspects of security perceptions and security and defense policies can be discussed by, by those who are directly involved. And there, let me make clear, uh, on the NATO side, at least uh, maybe at the beginning, there was some hesitation in uh, giving, uh, uh, in exploiting the NRC full potential. I think we have to admit uh, that uh, we should have done more and we can still do more on both sides. And uh, this is an appeal which applies to all players. On uh, 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 the social uh, economic issues, yes, I think OSC having a good, a solid base for soft security should and work and more and uh, uh, effectively on arms control. I fully agree with what uh, Ambassador Gruchko and uh, uh, Wolf Ischinger have said. Uh, OSCE and Vienna must remain a focus, but there is no doubt that NATO and Russia have to uh, 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 indicate uh, the landing, uh, the landing uh, uh, strip, and how to conduct uh, certain negotiations. So there is, in, in, in concluding, we have to continue to develop this concept of interlocking institutions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lukiana, for your, for the question. Uh, um, I listen to you every week and uh, I want to tell you that uh, this is, uh, the question is, uh, I don't like to oblige uh, OEC uh, with the solution of this issue. This is uh, very dear to our heart organization which uh, taught us over these 20 years uh, on the, uh, how to make elections, fair elections, uh, how to uh, uh, rise, uh, uh, bring up parties and uh, build up democracy. So it has a clear mandate in Central Asian countries, no doubt about this. But uh, I do believe that uh, the question of the withdrawal of uh, uh, NATO forces, all Western forces from Afghanistan and situation post 2014 is not in the center of uh, the world attention properly. So we should focus all of us on that and discuss because the first frontier uh, uh, are these countries. OIC will face Afghani problems and uh, all the consequences of the withdrawal in our countries. So and uh, if terrorism is recognized today wor worldwide as uh, one of the high uh, threats then uh, certainly it means that uh, uh, the countries uh, alongside of Afghanistan, like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, so in our countries where the economical situation is not good, then radicalization of uh, the whole population is ready. So with this regard, I do believe that uh, 
uh, all the decision makers in this uh, world, uh, G20, G8, uh, uh, OEC, OECD countries. Uh, so they should be aware that uh, we should first, of course, uh, uh, eliminate really poverty to, to soften, to mitigate all these problems in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to go uh, for solution of others. And uh, I want uh, to stress uh, that uh, those problems are uh, acute and uh, uh, OEC, whatever problems we we'll discuss in this organization, you should uh, every time, every time uh, remember that uh, they are such a fragile, very touchy frontier, which uh, will be, uh, the problems will be, uh, of, uh, it, it will be very late to solve if we will not come today to these problems. Swiss timing. When we come now to the Swiss ambassador, uh, the last word to you. <laughs> well, I have 30 seconds to conclude. <laughs> now, I would like to uh, uh, respond uh, uh, to a point that Rüdiger Lüdiking uh, uh, picked up and, and, and his question, why uh, isn't the OEC uh, used uh, to work more systematically on this widening gap between uh, East and West? Uh, why is the OEC uh, not used uh, uh, for East-West rapprochement uh, today? Uh, well, I guess the answer is a bit uh, uh, John Kornblum's answer this morning regarding the protracted conflicts. Uh, the OEC is a vessel, it's a toolbox, uh, it's a set of instruments, but then it's up to participating states, and particularly up to the big players, to use that platform. And uh, unfortunately for the time being, it is not uh, being used. And, uh, in a way, I regret that. Now, political will, of course, uh, will not simply uh, fall from heaven. So there is an attempt here in Vienna in the framework of this Helsinki Plus uh, 40 process uh, to mobilize uh, also interest uh, of participating states in the framework of this Helsinki Plus uh, 40 uh, process. Uh, uh, but again, in that process too, uh, at the end of the day, it will be decisive that there is the will uh, of um, participating states to use uh, the tools. The reason why I mentioned in my introductory statement uh, the mastery strategy of 2003 that provides us with this threat assessment is that I would see it as an interesting endeavor uh, to create trust and confidence by simply trying to update this strategy in the framework of this Helsinki plus 40 process and thereby realizing how convergent our threat perceptions are, and uh, on the basis uh, uh, of that, then come to a, a clear profile for, uh, let's say, the Helsinki plus 40 vision of uh, this uh, organization. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, what this organization uh, basically needs is mandates by participating states to address the relevant security issues. And, uh, well, in that sense, I was also wondering, uh, Ms. Lichinger, when I read your extremely interesting report, why you haven't selected the OEC as this overarching platform to discuss a new approach to uh, discussing the fundamentals of European security. As a critic, I would have tempted to say, well, yes, OEC is ideally placed uh, to do that. Conventional arms control. I mean, I think this would, of course, be the game changer for this organization if at some stage, as you know, we are now conducting very extensively informal discussions on conventional arms control. If at some stage we were to conclude that this is the platform to go a step beyond and use this also as a platform to then more formally discuss the principles of a future conventional arms regime in Europe, that would totally change. These are a few points that I wanted to raise. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a, a good discussion. This is an ongoing dialogue, not only, not only during these security days, but in the context of Helsinki Plus 40 and beyond. So uh, let's have a nice round of applause for our panel.
over from Libya across the Mediterranean. Um, next to him is Ambassador uh, Ezeldin Ramzi. He is um, the representative of the Arab League to Vienna, to the international organizations based in Vienna. I have on my right hand side uh, the, uh, the Turkish representative to the OSCE, Ambassador Tachan Ilden. Thank you, sir, for being with us. Uh, joined to his right hand side, uh, Mr. Dan Evertz, who is uh, an insider of OSCE and of out of area action with his um, experience in Central Asia and in, uh, notably in Afghanistan. And on his right hand side, we welcome here in Vienna Mrs. Karatayeva. She is the Deputy Director of the Institute of Strategic Studies from Kazakhstan. Mrs. Karatayeva will give her intervention uh, in Russian. So just uh, prepare your headphones because she will speak in Russian later on. Uh, the topic of our panel is, um, yeah, and my name is Karin Knasser, sorry, <laughs> forgot about myself. Um, the topic will be neighborhood policy, and here we come into a thorny topic, uh, semantic-wise, politics-wise, uh, where is Europe, what is the neighborhood of Europe, that's an old topic, who belongs to Europe, who doesn't belong, and uh, where does neighborhood start? Uh, I would like to divide our debate into one dealing with the Mediterranean, the Mare Nostrum, and if there were not the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, we would live around a pond, <laughs> but uh, we have the Mediterranean Sea that used to be for a long time a bridge. Today it's unfortunately more considered as a kind of barrier uh, between north, south, east, west, uh, and uh, we will then